Again, thank you and welcome to the Charitable Giving Resource Center uh, educational webinar today. I'm Gina David, Marketing Manager and Coordinator for the webinars. I'm filling in for Sue McEntee, who is uh, doing a little relaxation this week. She will be back in time for next week's webinar with the Charitable Gift Annuities. Um, but for today, we do have a few housekeeping things. If you're not dialed in uh, to the phone, um, obviously you won't be able to hear me, but be sure to do that. Um, and then we also have a couple of tools on the webinar um, screen, on your computer screen to the right there. If you have a question, we will answer those at the end. But um, uh, today's speaker will actually be asking you a few questions to ponder. And if you wanted to contribute, go ahead and type those in, and we will relay those thoughts through the uh, webinar today. Our presenter is uh, Wayne Johnson, who is a certified heritage professional with Transition Point Business Advisors here in West Des Moines. Wayne received his uh, CHP designation from the Heritage Institute, along with two other advisors, Lars Peterson and John Severson, after extensive studies and uh, real-life experience practicum. Wayne will walk through the Heritage Planning for Nonprofit uh, Donors and will incorporate the heritage process developed by the Heritage Institute as well. Again, we thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Wayne. Thank you, Gina. As our title indicates, uh, we are talking about heritage planning for the donors of nonprofits. It's, uh, heritage planning is meant to preserve family wealth and unity across generations. And that's the, the bullet that Gina just gave you about me. Uh, a little bit about Transition Point. Uh, the idea that Transition Point started with is that we were helping family businesses and closely held businesses move to the next generation of leadership. Well, in the process of doing that work, we also noticed that families needed help moving to the next generation of leadership. And uh, fortuitously, that is about the time that we became aware of the heritage process. So one thing led to another. As Gina mentioned, uh, the Transition Point Business Advisors has three certified heritage professionals, and we've all been trained by the Heritage Institute, or THI, uh, of, of Portland, Oregon. Um, the Heritage Institute engages in the research, development, application, and the reality of increasing the 10%. And we'll do a lot more talking about the 10% in just a few minutes. Here's our agenda for the day. Uh, the first thing that we'll talk about is how heritage planning builds lasting donor relationships for your nonprofit. Uh, that is, building that relationship is what builds a family relationship that can last for generations and benefit the cause of the nonprofit. We'll talk about the issues and gaps that traditional planning has not addressed. Uh, estate planning, financial planning, there have been some great, there's great work that is done in those areas, but those things do not assure that families and their wealth stay together across generations. Once we identify those gaps and those issues, we'll talk about a multi-generational solution that has worked for centuries. And finally, we'll talk about how how you can go about engaging each succeeding generation to, to build upon the successes of the, the past. One concept I'd like to talk a little bit about before we go into this is the idea of blue oceans. It's essentially a marketing concept. Um, a blue ocean is a pristine ocean where there is Nothing else exists that's like it at this point. Um, a red ocean is an ocean where all the sharks are and everybody is competing. Uh, a blue ocean changes the game. Uh, one of the best illustrations of a blue ocean that I've run into is the idea of Cirque du Soleil. It's not a circus. It's not a Broadway stage show. 
It's a combination of the two that gives the audience something completely different and do, really doesn't compete with either of those two things. It's, it's starting from a different place. And that's what the idea is with heritage planning. It is a way for a nonprofit to truly differentiate their relationship with key donor families. Our research has highlighted two key issues. First of all, donors expect or even demand a relationship with the organizations that they support. And second, traditional planning has failed to keep families and their fortunes together for three or more generations. Donors or clients one of the one of the things about um, heritage planning, it not only applies to nonprofits, it applies to the financial services industry. So a lot of the research has crossed over between um, charitable planning and the philanthropy world and the financial services world. And what the research has shown with regard to either donors or clients is that seventy five and a half percent of investors who fired their advisors do so because of lack of chemistry or poor working perform, rapport, not because of poor performance. CEG Worldwide, a consulting group, found that less than 1% of inheritors keep their parents' advisors. A similar, you, you could take that to the next level and say less, uh, a small percentage of inheritors are likely to keep are likely to remain aligned with their parents' philanthropic interests. And there is a direct correlation between knowing a, core, a donor's core values and the development of an ongoing philanthropic relationship with them. Before we get started, let's set the stage. How many of us have seen a case in which money has hurt someone in the family. Think about, if you can think about a specific family. Have you seen a case in which the money is squandered by the second or third generation? And do you think that is what the parents had in mind when they developed their plan? So let's do a quick brainstorm. Think to yourself. What do you think caused these unintended outcomes? Have you ever thought about the, the families that really do seem to have it together for generations? Um, what do those families actually do? What do they do differently? We'll talk about that later, but the 10% of families that are successful at keeping themselves together as a harmonious, a harmonious unit, maintaining their wealth, being a productive association, they do things differently. And that's what we'll talk about in a little while. There's a saying that smart people learn from their own experiences. Wise people learn from the experiences of others. And that's fundamental to the research that the Heritage Institute did. They wanted to find out what the successful families have done over, over time. When the Heritage Foundation founders, or the Heritage Institute founders, um, began their research, they, they went worldwide and looked at what had worked and what happened, what, what experiences had been throughout the world. And what they found was that success, successful families are rare regardless of where you are in the world. 2,000 years ago, there was a saying in China that says, wealth never survives three generations. 
In England, in the 1350s, their saying was clogs to clogs in three generations. Spain, Germany, the United States, and Brazil all had similar versions of this three generations of wealth within a family. So the lessons that were learned is it doesn't have anything to do with geography. Cultures, economies, governments, tax structure, those things are not the things that matter. Those, the problems have existed regardless of what economic situation was in place, and on, regardless of what the government was doing, and regard, regardless of the culture. And this applies to your donors. When the families no longer get together, they're unlikely to continue to support the causes that they once did. So that identifies the problem. It identifies the problem for families, and it also identifies the problems for nonprofits. Contemporary studies verify that the quotes from the past verify the quotes from the past, and they conclude that 90% of the families failed to keep their families and their fortunes together for more than three generations. So those cases we talked about at the very beginning, where money hurt someone in the family, or the second and third generation that blew it all, they're not the exception to the rule. They are the rule. So let's talk about the gaps. And what, you know, what is done in planning today? And what do people think caused their problem versus what actually did cause their problems? Actually, there's a huge gap between what people think causes the loss of family wealth and what really causes it. There's a stark contrast as shown in two recent studies. In 2009, the Family Office Exchange surveyed its members about perceived risk now, and what was the most critical risk facing their family. And in 2003, uh, who was that? Williams and Pricer wrote a book called Preparing Their Heirs, and they reported their, their, their study of families who actually lost their wealth. And here are the results. In 2009, Right after the most recent financial meltdown, families of wealth felt that their biggest risk was investment strategy risk, or the economy and financial markets, or perhaps financial constraints. Family dynamics and family relationships only received, received less than one out of ten votes as far as what families thought would cause their problems. Williams and Pricer, who did their study back in 2003, right after another financial downturn, asked people, what was the problem that your family encountered? People that had lost their wealth, what got gotcha? you? Their, their response overwhelmingly was lack of communication and trust, and another one was unprepared errors. Failures in financial planning, taxes, and investments was only 3% of the responses. Another huge gap exists between what is known about wealth transfer and what is actually done. There have been a number of studies related to wealth transfer in recent years. They've been done from the Ivy League schools, the um, Ivy League schools, the Journal of Gift Planning and National Charitable Initiative. Uh, financial services companies, and of course, um, beating the Midas curse by Perry Cochelle and Rod Steve, the two founders of the Heritage Institute. And what they've known, what they've concluded, is the following. As we said, 90% of families lose the family money within three generations, and that's been true for thousands of years. The successful 10% do these things. They're successful because they share these common characteristics. They meet regularly and they have fun together. They have good communication and they trust each other. That doesn't mean they always agree, but they do trust each other and they do talk. 
They know their family's story. They know where they came from. They active, actively mentor successive generations. Sometimes it's grandparents, sometimes it's aunts and uncles, and sometimes it's parents that do this mentoring. They celebrate shared values and their accepting of their differences. And they understand that wealth is not just money. They have a different definition of wealth. There's another gap that's out there. It's what do we want versus what is offered? What, what would a donor value coming from a charity versus what is offered to them? Allianz did a study on inheritances, and they sur surveyed both baby boomers and the next generation up, the elders or the Depression era. Surprisingly, both groups, the most, to both groups, the most important inheritance they could give or receive was the family story and life lessons. 70%, 77% of each group placed that as their number one, as their number one um, wish to receive from their heirs or what they wanted to pass down. For baby boomers, it was 10 times more important to pass or receive the family story and life lessons than financial assets or real estate. Of the, of the elder generation, when asked what was most important for them to pass down, their response overwhelmingly was a matter of spirit, followed closely by, some, by something related to their faith, their passion, their enthusiasm, their sense of humor. Very little of what they really value is addressed by conventional financial and estate planning. Here's a definition of estate planning that's been around since the late 80s. I want to control my assets while I'm alive and take care of myself and my loved ones if I become disabled. I want to give them what I, what I have. I want to give what I have to whom I want, the way I want, and when I want. And I want to minimize professional fees and court costs while effectively administering my affairs and to save every last tax dollar possible. Again. Very, very little of that has anything to do with what people say is most important for them to pass to the next generation. And people, professionals have been doing great work in this area for the past 30 or 40 years. But it's not solving the problem that families have. To fill the gap, we have to act on what we know and expand on what we do essentially using that blue ocean strategy to fill in this gap. So often we look at what got at what got us into a problem and we go back to additional traditional planning and we want to go bigger, better, stronger, faster. We do this because that's really all we know. Instead, we need to start from a different place and look for a blue ocean. And that's what heritage planning is. So we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Let's face it, traditional estate planning ignored some of the most important issues as far as what it takes if you become some of the most important issues. Like what happens if you become disabled in your life? Or at the, at the time those assets get passed on, how will they impact the surviving spouse, the kids, or grandkids? Planners forgot to address issues that ended up being more divisive than even taxes or court matters. Families are often split apart by disputes about who gets the family photos or who had dibs on mom's pie plate. More tragically, these ineffective plans dumped assets on kids only to see them wiped out by divorces where up to half of the family's wealth is carted off by a departing spouse. Also, kids and the surviving spouse were left exposed to lawsuits and creditor claims. Finally, many families felt guilty over the fact that they never took the time to capture the memories, wisdom, and life stories of their parents or they were lost forever. So how did this happen? It's not due to a lack of traditional financial and estate planning. 
it's due to the fact that we were focused on transferring money rather than wealth and not having a solid foundation to support the inheritance that's being given and received. And remember, we spoke earlier of how successful families viewed wealth differently. Successful families didn't focus on financial capital, they focused on their foundation, their human capital, their relationships, the wisdom and intellectual capacity, their education, their experiences, and their role in the community because few people succeed without a strong community around them. The idea of successful families is that if you have a strong foundation, if you have intellectual capital, and if you're a a progressive member of your community, the financial capital will come. So that leads to the specific question of what do the successful 10% do differently? The successful 10% use what we refer to as the third element of successful multi-generational planning, the heritage process. They begin by developing and fostering effective intergenerational communication. Once that's established, they move on to providing plentiful and meaningful pre-inheritance experiences where the heirs actually work together and develop trust among each other and with the between generations. And in this process, they develop genuine leadership transfer within the family. This is a diagram of how the heritage process works. It begins with an initial conversation to determine a family or a donor's interest in the heritage process. The next step is to discuss to go through a guided discovery process where people learn from their own experiences what really is important to them, what are their values, what were the turning points in their lives, and what is their vision for the future. The outcome of this guided discovery process is a written heritage statement that's used as a guiding light for the family to make their decisions and, to, and a kind of a touchstone about understanding where they're from. They use this to pass their heritage to the next generation at Heritage Days, where the family gets together and begins the transfer of leadership and the development that's needed for, for family leadership to be strong for generations. After the initial Heritage Day, ongoing pre-inheritance experiences are developed and, and reported on at ongoing family councils. The conclusions from our studies and practices that we've observed on wealth transfer is that if 90% of families lose their money within three generations, and it's been true for thousands of years, these are the successful, these are what the successful donor families share as far as common characteristics and how they're supported by the heritage process. They meet regularly and they have fun together. That's done at the ongoing family council. Every, uh, every family council includes doing the um, getting together and having fun, addressing the business of being family, and doing family development. They develop good communication and trust, and that is done with the pre-inheritance experiences that are reported upon at each ongoing family council meeting. They know their family story. They read the heritage statement, they use the heritage statement, and it's developed, it continues to develop with, at the ongoing family councils. They actively mentor the successive generations. As I said earlier, it, it isn't just parents to children, it's aunts and uncles to nieces and nephews as well. They celebrate their shared values and they accept their differences. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, they understand wealth differently. It's not just the money. 
very little of the heritage process has anything to do specifically with money. So this is how the heritage process works. It starts with guided discovery, and that leads to a heritage statement. The heritage statement is foundational to a family's financial planning approach, their estate planning approach, and it's all supported by their heritage planning process. Once the heritage statement is completed, it's shared with the other professionals on the family's team, the attorneys, the accountants, the financial planners, to develop a collaborative team to get what's important to the family, not just to select effective strategies, but to have a vision, a shared vision among every member of the team to get what's important to the family. Financial and estate planning, prepare your assets for you and your family. Heritage planning prepares your family to receive those assets and their emotional inheritance. So that leads us to two questions. What the, to the next big question, and it goes to generation two, the kids or the grandkids. How are you going to motivate them to participate in this process? So they'll ask themselves two questions. Is it worth it and can I do it? And we have a story of um, the, one of the um, people that contributed to the heritage process uh, found when he worked with his teenagers. The first, uh, first year, he gave the kids money for vacation and said, okay, here's the vacation money. Go invest it. How you do depends on what we get, uh, what we get to do for vacation next year. The kids went out and they found a whole bunch of penny stocks because they were going to go to Disneyland. And uh, that really didn't work out so well for them. They ended up going and visiting relatives that year and staying with them because they lost all their money. The next year, they learned that if they put it in the bank and got, this is back when you could get a reasonable interest rate at the bank, they put it in the bank and they, they invested um, more prudently that they got to take a, they went on a camping trip. It wasn't Disneyland yet, but, they were making progress. And at the end of that second year, the father asked his teenage son, well, what did you learn from this? And the father was expecting, you know, be more prudent or something like that. And what the son said is, well, that my choices affect everybody, can affect everybody in the family. That was an epiphany for that father. But that's when that he realized through that that being engaged in this family process was worth it and he could do it. That's why that boy was, was motivated to take part and buy into the heritage process. So that's how the heritage process works and it's how it can develop your donor base and connect you more deeply to your donors for generations to come. I'd like to close with this last slide that every affluent parent wishes that they knew how to give their children the hardships that made them rich. And that is really true. At this point, that pretty much covers everything that I had. Um, what questions do you have? Okay. Well, given that, thank you for your attendance. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to get in touch with us, and we'd be happy to discuss further with you how the heritage process can be beneficial to your organization. Have a good day.